This is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson Podcast. So when I think LiDAR, LiDAR and something like this would be interesting too because I would be interested to know if it's actually larger than the vegetation implies. In other words, has it been shrinking since? Yeah. Like have the, have the trees been growing inwards? Encroaching, yeah. yeah. Interesting yeah, question just, yeah. because, you know, some of the um, features that Brad and I have been investigating in the field, flood-caused features, for example, the Hickory Run Boulder Field and the Blue Rocks Boulder Field, which are both um, – Right. Also known as singing rocks up in Pennsylvania are good examples where you can, and we'll have pictures of this, you know, in an upcoming episode where people will be able to see some, some of these features, but almost certainly produced by a, uh, a an oversaturated uh, matrix of material moving almost on a horizontal plane, but choked with boulders. And one of the things is, is that, You'll, you might see an area that's 100 yards or 200 yards wide of just barren boulders. The trees are growing at the edge. But if you go over to the edge and you go into the trees, you realize that the boulder field is much wider than the barren area between the trees. And just like you, were, you said there, Russ, the trees are encroaching. And probably in a few more centuries or another millennia, you'll eventually have this whole uh, barren boulder field completely grown over and then eventually soil will will fill in the the interstices between the rocks and you get a layer of soil and 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 you know a thousand years from now two thousand years from now you might it might be difficult to know that you're actually walking on this lag deposit of these thousands tens of thousands of huge boulders that you're are talking about forming the upper layer of the landscape. You're talking about Ringing Rocks Park? Is that what you're referencing there in Pennsylvania? Yeah. Yeah. You, you've been there? No, but I, I've studied it. Yeah, it's very interesting. It's very yeah, interesting. Yeah we, yeah, we we went there. We went to a couple of those. And that was one of the things that I immediately saw was, well, okay, you look at the thing and, and, and it looks this wide, but it actually extends up under the forest for a considerable, like twice the width of what you're actually seeing. Yeah. So yeah, the forest is in, encroaching upon it. Tell you what I'm going to do. I went ahead and pulled up a uh, picture of the boulder stream so people just can see what we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, um, you might you might find this interesting too, uh, Russ, since you you've studied it here. Let me share screen. Yeah. Yeah. This is the Hickory Run Boulder Field. Wow. Pretty interesting, isn't it? Yeah, so those, <laughs> those are people out there. Right. Yeah. This, that gives you the scale. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and here you can see how, how broken and jagged these rocks are. Yeah. They're sharp and yeah. Yeah. And, and there's our old friend, Jeremy walking over all this in his bare feet. He's the, he's the one we mentioned last week that went to Oregon to search out Bigfoot ah. or Sasquatch. So, Jeremy, if you ever end up watching this, we miss you, buddy. We'd love to see you again someday. That's right. We shared a lot of good adventures together. I hope you found that Bigfoot wife you were looking for. Um, and there's a lot of little furry ones now running around. <laughs> um, <laughs> he so. was always barefoot. Is this... <laughs> Is this Ringing Rocks Park, though? No, this is Hickory Run Boulder Okay, Field, this is Hickory Run. Okay. Which is mostly, place, as it yeah. says, red sandstones and conglomerates. Here's, right. here's Ringing Rocks, or Blue Rocks Boulder Field. Wow. And this is interesting because you can actually hear Still the, the water percolating <laughs> below this feature. Oh. Mm -hmm. And there you, you see Jeremy again. You know, he's, he's listening to the, to the water trickling underneath but now this is a, a, a case exactly what i was talking about what you see here is only like half of it the other half is now up under the trees and right. is slowly being encroached upon and being covered over by growth and new soil and all this and that and eventually 
it'll be hard to tell that this feature, this thing was even here. Right. And that implies that it's not very old. I, right. I would guess. Well, yeah. yeah. I'm going to guess though, I'm going to guess that this is a function of the, 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 the events of 12,000 years ago. Right. That's uh, geologically not very old. Right. 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 They geologically, it, it's not very old. It's not. The French drain of the gods. <laughs> I'm not sure about that, Kyle, but maybe you could write <laughs> I mean, a paper it's, on it. And sub, sub, it's a theory. A review. <laughs> so these are, these are uh, boulder fields, sometimes boulder streams, depending on if the length of it is much wider, greater than the width, it's referred to as a boulder stream. And if it's generally like Hickory Run Boulder Field, because it's it's almost as wide as it is long. What's the source of the stone? Do, do, um, they, do they know? Well, let's see. I don't have it here, but it's it's nearby uplands. Uh, this okay. is in the Adirondacks foothills in northern Pennsylvania, and we'll come be coming back to looking at this because okay. I think that this may uh, correlate with the same event that produced the Finger Lakes. Mm. Valley Heads Moraine that exists at the south end of the Finger Lakes and the Drumlin Swarm that exists between the north end of the Finger Lakes and the uh, southern coast of Lake Ontario, which is r something really, really interesting that we're going to come back to um, when we start looking at the potential consequences of a multi-impact event at the Younger Dryas boundary, including impacts into the ice sheet itself, into the Laurentide and possibly Cordillera and ice sheets. So I will stop to share there. Now we know what a boulder stream and a boulder uh, boulder field is. And, and the important takeaway from this is that it shows you that there are these, now we could argue about the, the nature of the, uh, the boulder fields, right? Uh, how they were produced and so on. But the point is, is that However, they were created, what precise mechanism created, and I'm quite certain that it's catastrophic, that it's not the result of normal day to day processes. Like, in other words, what's going on there now in that environment is not creating features like this. These are features that are created in an environment that's very, very different. Um, so, the thing to, to take away, though, is, is the idea that, um, is the idea that these are slowly being obscured by the modern day processes. See, what we're witnessing is uniformitarianism at work. Uniformitarianism is now going to work and slowly obliterating the evidence of earlier catastrophes, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's see here if I can. That was way back in 2001, too. Sounds like a conspiracy to me. No, that was in 2001 we visited that. Yeah, we we flew the week after 9-11. Oh, wow. That's right. Yeah, because um, one of the guys wouldn't go, was afraid to go. Didn't want to get on a plane, but yeah, we flew right after that. Aha, uh -huh. but we boldly went, didn't we? That's right. Okay, here's, here's what uh, one geologist wrote about the Hickory Run Boulder Field way back in 1953. The extension of the boulder accumulation across the entire valley bottom indicates an interruption of the normal progress of stream erosion. Aha. Uh -huh. It is evident that the pre-existing balance between stream transportation and the supply of material from the bordering slopes must have been completely disrupted for a time. The main section of the Hickory Run boulder field is a fish-shaped bouldery tract measuring roughly 400 by 1,800 feet. The general surface of the boulder field is a barren expanse of jumbled cobbles and boulders of widely varied size and shape. The tumultuous appearance of the surface suggests arrested motion after forcible movement, somewhat in the fashion of an ice jam in a river. I like that, arrested motion after forcible movement. 
So in other words, you have a short-lived phenomena, a great deal of force is engendered, and you have the deposition of this boulder field, and then it suddenly is arrested, and now it sits there as a fossil feature in the landscape being slowly obscured by the normal processes of erosion and deposition. And that, I think, is consistent with so many of the, uh, the, the types of evidence for past catastrophes is that you see cataracts being slowly eroded away, right? You don't see cataracts being, being eroded and created today like you do because even, even over, and this is one of the things getting us back to this, to the LIDAR thing, this is where it's going to be really fascinating when we finally can get into doing that is because hidden under all of the forests of the Southeast are these vast landscapes catastrophically created but you generally don't see them because of the thick canopy of, of forest growth. With LIDAR, we're going to be able to see those hidden canyons and coulees and cataracts and things, just like we can see out West in the various States. Um, so yeah, that's going to be one of our projects in the near future. Now that D Brad is a licensed drone pilot, once we've got a few more resources, we're going to be, doing some serious drone uh, 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 LIDAR research. And Absolutely. just like uh, Davius is using um, the, 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 the LIDAR uh, technology to be able to perceive, for example, bays, Carolina bays that are invisible, right, from the surface, but they're there hidden under the canopy of vegetation. We're going to use it to, to reveal some of these hidden landscapes of catastrophe um, to show that these landscapes are much greater in extent and vaster scale than even a lot of geologists are aware of. And I know that because I mean, I read incessantly the papers and we communicate with these guys. So I know their models. I know the framework of their thinking. And my only criticism is that, wait a second, you guys looking at the spillways up in North Dakota are not necessarily connecting them with the channel scablands in Washington or the finger lakes in New York or the boulder fields in Pennsylvania, right? Or the, uh, uh, or, or the, the, the rock arches and bed forms in, in Utah and, and Arizona, et cetera, et cetera. What we need is an integrative model that we now begin looking at these things and realize that these are not a series of, of randomly isolated events, but are part of a much larger pattern. So that's, I think where, where all of this kind of thing needs to go. So in the time that we've got left, let's let's get back to um, the Tunguska event. 